Hi and welcome back to another video. Today I'm talking about easements and in particular the relationship that we have with the land and the land has with each other, which ultimately forms an easement. But first of all, if you're new here, please do hit the subscribe button, the like button and the notification bell so you get notifications of new videos. So in order to describe easements, I'd like you to think about land as something that we have a special relationship with. It's a relationship of possession because we spend most of our lives on the land. Section 205 of the Law of Property Act 1925 defines land as the physical surface area of the land and below it and any fixtures and buildings upon it. There is also an argument and debate about the airspace above land and property which was decided in Burstein and Sky Views, which I've referenced actually in the comments to one of my other videos about drone law because in Burstein and Sky Views the court decided that the property owner owns and controls the airspace immediately above the property, but not anything beyond that. And thus that lower portion of airspace constitutes part of the land. So this talk is going to be a little bit academic, so I'm going to refer to academic articles and cases as well. All of these references are going to be in the description below, which is going to help you as a general point of interest, but it's also going to help the law students that are researching easements and land law. Specifically, if you're doing a law degree, because these are some of the things that you're going to find on your law degree on the land module, which forms one of the seven foundations of law. Gray writes that the term property is often incorrectly used when it's used to refer to a thing or land. Instead, Gray suggests that we should be thinking about property as the relationship that we have with the land. In other words, the control or the ownership of it. Now, with all that in mind, nothing resembles this relationship with land and between land more than the subject of easements. So first of all I'm going to talk about the relationships between pieces of land and then I'm going to go on to talk about the relationships between the owners of those pieces of land as well. Chapter 34 of Oxford University Press, linked below, defines an easement as a right or benefit over one piece of land for the benefit of another piece of land. The land that received this benefit is known as the dominant tenement and the land that is providing this benefit for the other piece of land is known as the servient tenement. There is also something called a profit pondre, which is similar to an easement in that it allows one piece of land to take something from the other piece of land for the benefit of personal enjoyment. But I'm not going to get into that too much in this video because that does wander off track slightly. Given the broad definition of what land is, there is considerable scope for an easement to exist between two pieces of land. And this can create fairly significant relationships, not just between the two pieces of land, but between the owners, the leaseholders, and the tenants of those pieces of land too. In the case Re Ellenborough Park, the Court of Appeal set a four-stage test to identify an easement. The first part of that test is that there must be a dominant and servient tenement. In other words, two pieces of land, one of them is serving something for the benefit of the other. Secondly, those pieces of land must be owned by different persons. Thirdly, quite obviously, the servient tenement must accommodate the dominant tenement in some way. Finally, the right that is claimed as an easement must be capable of forming the subject matter of a grant. In other words, it must be sufficiently definite, it must be similar to some other kind of easement that already exists, and it must not fully exclude the rights of the landowner of the servient tenement, otherwise it might amount to some kind of adverse possession or squatter's rights. There are some interesting cases that exemplify the relationship between the land rather than just looking at the interests of the owners or the estate owners of that land. One example of this is in the case of Hill and Tupper of 1863. An easement was claimed as the right to put boats on a neighbouring canal. However, this was held not to be an easement because in that case it was benefiting the business on the land and not the land itself. However, when you compare and contrast this with the right of way that one land has over another piece of land, such as the case of Borman and Griffiths. In this case, the court accepted there was an easement so long as there was some clearly defined road or track. And again, this brings us back to the idea that there's a relationship between the two pieces of land. It isn't just one right over another. There is this relationship going on underneath. However, if you were trying to claim an easement by way of a second access to the land for reasonable enjoyment, this may not constitute an easement. And this is exactly what the Court of Appeal decided in Wheeler and J.J. Saunders. 
Saunders Limited. Essentially, the Court of Appeal decided that the second access wasn't necessary for reasonable enjoyment of the land and refused to grant an easement in that case. The easement of storage is an interesting concept as well, because whilst it's generally accepted that storage can amount to an easement, the courts have had difficulty to rationalise it, because it ultimately means that one piece of land is depriving the other piece of land of the storage for whichever area that's being used to store. Now, if you remember, if one piece of land is depriving the other piece of land of any rights on that particular area, that might cause a problem. Although storage in and of itself is generally accepted that it can satisfy those requirements of an easement. So in the case of Wright and McAdam in 1949, the court didn't consider this too much of a problem and decided that it could amount to an easement. But again, there's a contrasting case in Copeland and Greenhalf, where the High Court rejected the claims of an owner that he had the right to store vehicles on neighbouring land, because ultimately it amounted to possession and prevented the use of that land by its owner, or at least the joint use, which was the case in Wright and McAdam. So you can see the subtle differences and nuances between these two cases emphasise that it is a relationship between the land rather than just depriving the rights of one piece of land by another piece of land. This, of course, is part of the test in Re Alhambra Park, where if the benefits are completely deprived, it's not going to meet the test to satisfy an easement. An even deeper illustration of this contrast can be found in Green and Ashco Horticultural Limited, where the claim for the right to park a van failed because the nature of the relationship between the two pieces of land was that the claimant would move the van at the discretion and request of the servient owner. And so this suggested that any sort of easement or right only existed at the discretion of the owner of the servient piece of land, and thus an easement wasn't created. So ultimately this is an example where the relationship between the two pieces of land was creating a license of use rather than an easement. Another way easements can be seen as a relationship between two pieces of land is how they are formed in the first place, because they can either be a legal easement or they can be an equitable easement. And in order to be created as a legal easement, Section 1 of the Law of Property Act 1925 provides that it must be granted with the same certainty as the estate itself. So either in absolute possession or for a fixed number of years. And for a better explanation on this in relation to the Law of Property Act, I'll link a card now which talks about land and land ownership. And so the upshot of this is that a legal easement will either forever or for certainly a fixed number of years define the relationship between those two pieces of land. In other words, the servient and the dominant tenement. One land serving another piece of land for some kind of right or benefit. And it's worth mentioning that such legal easements also need to be created by way of deed, just as a legal estate itself. Although, and again, it's worth mentioning that the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989 provides that an equitable easement may exist if the grant is provided in the form of a contract. Whereas if the relationship between the two pieces of land has existed for a very long period of time, then this may qualify as an exception and it may be assumed that it was made in the proper form albeit fictional. Sometimes even the simplest relationship between two pieces of land can be so fundamental to the basic enjoyment of that land that it simply couldn't exist without an easement. Then of course this might give rise to an easement of necessity. This is the kind of example where you would find a right of way which is necessary in order to access, for example, landlocked land, which is a piece of land surrounded by other land that cannot be accessed without going over another piece of land it's necessary to access that land through some kind of right of way. On the one hand, the vendor of such a landlocked piece of land might expressly state that no easement is being created. This was a principle approved in a deal on International Property Limited. In other cases, there might be implied rights of access, such as the staircases that would be necessary to access certain parts of a building, as was the case in Liverpool City Council and Irwin. This is why it's so important to consider the relationships between owners of pieces of land and owner-occupiers of parts of that land that might need to access or have certain rights over surrounding pieces of land in order to benefit from proper enjoyment. So think of the scenario where someone has enjoyed a certain right of access or a certain kind of easement for a certain period of time and then comes to sell that part of land, it would be necessary to be selling that land with the same rights and easements and benefits attached 
as the owner occupier was enjoying for that period of time. This is the kind of acquisition of an easement that is considered under section 62 of the Law of Property Act 1925 and considered in the case of Wall and Collins. This was a case where the tenant bought out his landlord and the Court of Appeal decided that a legal easement already existed and the conveyance of that property had the effect of transferring it. But of course this kind of easement must meet the standard test of an easement and must not be expressly contradicted in the conveyance in order to qualify under section 62. So in short, easements are a necessary consideration and reflect the power and the relationship between owners of pieces of land and pieces of land themselves. They cannot simply be looked at in isolation in terms of the land, they must be considered in the terms of the relationship between the owners of the land, whether there's a business on the land, whether it is necessary to access that part of the land, and whether that right or enjoyment has been going on for a long period of time, in which case you might be acquiring that easement. So in summary, it's very important to consider whether a legal or equitable easement exists between two pieces of land or whether one might have arisen over time. As you can appreciate from the very few cases that I've listed in this video, it's a very complex subject and I would urge you to seek formal legal advice and don't just assume anything based on the contents of this video. But that said, I really do hope you enjoyed the video and please hit the subscribe button, the bell icon, the like button, go crazy and come back and watch more videos if you enjoy listening to some free legal guidance from a practicing barrister and I'll see you next time.